Do you know who the happiest people are? The happiest people are the people with the most intact relationships. In 2016, I answered God's call to start a ministry that would reach youth with the truth about God's plan for sex and marriage. My name is Enza Sarami, and my passion is sharing God's plan for love and life-giving relationships with teens, young adults, and parents. Join me at happiestpeople.org to find out more information. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ruggiero, and I serve as the Secretary for the Secretariat for Family and Pastoral Life for the Diocese of Metuchen in New Jersey. I also serve as the Director of the Office of Human Life and Dignity, and today I'll be talking with you about end-of-life issues. In my pro-life work, I've learned that pro-life work is not only for the babies in the womb, the unborn babies in the womb, it also applies to those who face the end of their life, whether it's a terminal illness, someone that's frail and elderly, or someone's got chronic illness, or someone that's just close to the end of life. Uh, we need to treat them and protect them with respect and dignity. So I'm gonna start by uh, just reading a quote to you. And blessed are those who never turned away, and blessed are those who stood quietly in the rain. There shall be the harvest, for them the fruits. And that's a quote from the Book of Hours, and it really sums up uh, my whole talk today. We are called to journey with or accompany those who, are we, who we are entrusted with, who we are entrusted to care for at life's end, whether it's a loved one, a family member, or a friend. So last September, as the world grappled with a global pandemic, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith issued a beautiful document called Samaritanus Bonus, or translated, the Good Samaritan. And it is a letter on how we as Catholics should care for those in our lives who are in the critical or terminal phases of life. The document was approved by Pope Francis, and it's a really important document for healthcare professionals, for caregivers, for care, pastoral care workers, for families, and even for those who are sick. Essentially, the letter is an invitation to imitate the Good Samaritan, who not only draws nearer to the half-dead man on the road, but also takes responsibility for him. And this is a very familiar story, the Good Samaritan, and you can read about it in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. Samaritanus Bonus proclaims the sacredness of each and every human life, irregardless of the stage or the condition. And with regards to the sick and dying, the letter reaffirms the Hippocratic maxim, primum non nucore, first do no harm. It reiterates the church's position opposing assisted suicide or euthanasia because they, they are considered intrinsically evil practices because they directly cause the death of an innocent life. And some of you may remember that just about two years ago, New Jersey passed a law allowing what they call medical aid in dying, which essentially is allowing physician-assisted suicide for anyone that's six months or less, uh, has a six month or less uh, chance of living um, with a terminal diagnosis. Uh, this is a very dangerous practice and just having it legal in our state is giving those who are facing death temptation to take advantage of this measure. And uh, so that we need as Catholics to be aware of this and we need to be um, ever present to those in our lives that are nearing death so that they don't choose this particular option. It also talks a little bit about the cultural obstacles uh, that we face in our, in our world today. Um, there's a false misunderstanding of, of compassion and individualism. We have a utilitarian society where if you don't have autonomy or if you can't do certain things or if you're um, dependent on others, you're seen as a burden. And um, Pope Francis refers to this as a throwaway culture. And this letter instead offers a beautiful pastoral vision and really concrete guidelines on how we can remain with the sick and dying and when, when there's no cure likely or possible. And just as the Good Samaritan looks at his neighbor with a heart that sees with profound compassion, so too we are called to convey that attitude of love to those we love who are uh, near death. The letter also talks about the importance of palliative care and hospice care, as well as administrating the, the sacraments when death is near. It talks about the different stages of suffering for those in the process of dying, 
There's physical suffering, psychological pain, moral suffering, and spiritual suffering. And it reminds us that Jesus too endured all of these types of suffering in his life and on the cross. And this suffering was used to open heaven. So in a very personal way, um, when I came across this document, uh, it really provided me with a lot of uh, consolation. This past January, my seemingly healthy 89-year-old aunt, uh, who I've always been very close with, was diagnosed unexpectedly with stage four cancer. She had been recently widowed. Her husband uh, died back in May of 2020 um, after dealing with COVID. And um, they had never had children together. So she uh, was lonely for the first time in a long time. She was a widow and, and uh, she was lonely and, and uh, it was very hard for her. But she was very active and up until January, she's very active and um, very involved in my life and, and my children's lives my husband. So uh, we decided with this diagnosis, she lived about an hour away, we decided that instead of her facing this new reality alone, that we would invite her in to live with us um, as she faced her, her new diagnosis. And overnight, I went from being just her niece to being her caregiver, spending hours and hours consulting doctors, taking her for tests, picking up prescriptions and helping her to discern her treatment options. So in the process, what I learned was um, that while all these acts of service was really important to her, the best gift that I and my family could give her was that of human warmth, of being present to her, of being welcoming and being available to her. And God blessed us with hearts that see, and we helped her to navigate the different stages of her suffering. Thankfully, she had very little physical pain, but she grieved the loss of her independence, and she worried about being a burden to us. And again and again, I reminded her that although she generously gave her whole life practically caring for those around her as a caregiver, it was now her turn to be taken care of. And unfortunately, her journey was only three, three short months. Uh, we had her in our home and um, we had hospice come in and uh, we, we asked God in too. Um, her final days were very difficult, but they were filled with many blessings and graces. And thankfully, my family and I were able to witness to her unique and unrepeatable value by keeping vigil with her and by remaining by her bedside until God called her home. This was not my first experience with death, of the death of a loved one, and probably will not be my last. Um, years ago, when my mother was diagnosed with cancer and, and she was in the dying stages with hospice, a good friend gave me this book entitled Midwife for Souls, Spiritual Care for the Dying. Midwife for Souls, Spiritual Care for the Dying. And it's written by a hospice nurse and it's just so beautiful. It's filled with hope and provides prayers and scriptural passages. And it shows how the support of one's Catholic faith can really help to guide you as you accompany others to the edge of the earthly life and onto the next. It's written by a hospice nurse and hospice has been wonderful. I, I uh, had hospice with my mom, and, and she, she had home hospice in her own home, and my aunt had hospice in our home, and the, the nurses were just wonderful. Um, so I would highly recommend this book. I've actually bought several copies and given them away because it was a real gift to me when I was journeying with my mom in her final days. There's an old uh, Irish proverb that says, it is the shelter of each other. It is in the shelter of each other that the people live. Indeed, we are created to depend on, upon one another and walk together in suffering. But, you know, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, when, when family members or, uh, or friends approach life's end, and we may not know how to journey with them. It's, it's kind of scary. So I just want to talk a little bit about some concrete ways that you can, um, you know, get through this time if you're faced to uh, care for someone at the end of life. And, and most of us will be called to do that at some point or another. So number one, invite God in. Pope Francis says that praying during difficult times, we're actually opening a door for the Lord to come in and to enter, enter into our lives. And the dying process, I can truly say, is a very sacred time. It's a final season to seek closure in this life and to prepare, prepare for the next and hope that we're going to be sharing in Christ's resurrection. So as you journey with a friend or a loved one or a family member that's, you know, facing life's end, um, ask God to accompany you. Ask God to come in. Pray to God that he'll give you the strength, the hope, the patience, all of those things that you're going to need during this important time. 
Number two, listen. Listen to your loved one. Uh, listen to their fears. Listen to their, their values and, and what their wishes are during this time. Uh, listen with a non-judgmental ear. Sometimes we think we know the best answers, but really a lot of this journey when someone's facing life's end is very personal. It's very individual and everybody has different ideas. So listening is, is very key. You want them to be able to open up and speak freely to you. So um, try to listen and, and take it in and discern uh, what their, their wishes are and try to abide by them. Number three, and this is really important. I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail. Inform yourself. Catholic teaching on end-of-life care can be very misunderstood. You want to be aware of the different treatment options and what is considered ordinary care and what is considered extraordinary care. I'm going to give you some examples here. Ordinary means or proportionate means are medicines, treatments, procedures, and technology that offer a reasonable hope of benefit and which can be obtained without much pain, expense, or burden. That's ordinary care. An example here would be if you had a cold, you would take cold medicine. If you had pain, you would take pain reliever. If you had an infection, you would take antibiotics. If you broke a bone, you'd go get your, your bone reset and, and put in a cast. If you have diabetes, you take your diabetes, med diabetes medication. These are all ordinary measures of care and can be done without pain or burden or too much of an expense. Extraordinary means, sometimes called just proportionate, refers to all medicines, treatments, procedures, and technology that do not offer a reasonable hope of benefit or cannot be obtained or used without excessive pain, expense, or burden. So an example here would be a cancer patient like my mom or my aunt. Um, you know, you can, you have an obligation to take ordinary means. You don't have an obligation to do extraordinary means. Um, you can if you'd like to, you have that option, but you do not have an obligation as a Catholic to do extraordinary means. So case in point would be a cancer patient going through a surgery to remove a tumor, but then maybe turning down the, the chemo, or maybe doing the chemo for two months and just saying, you know, it's, it's too burdensome, it's too painful, I don't want to be feeling like this in my final stage. So that chemo becomes an extraordinary measure, which can be, which can be uh, withdrawn or stopped, or just not even agreed to to begin with. So those are the things that we need to um, think about uh, when someone in our lives are facing those types of decisions. And as I mentioned, uh, my aunt had some important decisions to make. She was 89 years old. She had stage four cancer, which had metastasized throughout her body. She was very weak and frail. And the doctors, of course, they want to do everything they can. And they asked her if she would be willing to um, have her have, go through a procedure. I won't go into the, the, the details about it, but have a procedure that they thought would help so that she would be able to be a candidate for some kind of a treatment. And she, she grappled with that. And I spoke with the doctors numerous times. Um, and uh, we went back and back and forth. And she just was not ready to die. So she decided to have the procedure, even though it was considered an extraordinary measure. Um, and as it turned out, the procedure really didn't work. It didn't really benefit her. As a matter of fact, I think it, it, it hastened things a little bit with the progression of her cancer. But it was a very personal decision. And that's what the doctor said to me, that this is really up to her. We can talk to her about the, the benefits and the burdens, the risks, um, but uh, it's a personal decision and it's really case by case and we really need to respect the, the patient's wishes. But be informed about what those risks and benefits are. So Catholics have a moral obligation to use ordinary means to preserve their lives, but they can choose to do extraordinary means, but they have no ob obligation to do so. So if she had said no to that procedure, she would have been you know, following Catholic teaching um, in, in her decision. So um, hospice care, as I mentioned, um, basically focuses on uh, alleviating pain and other symptoms and providing comfort. So in the final days, um, usually six months or less to live, hospice is often called in to give the patient comfort, to, you know, do some kind of treatment if you have mouth sores or or if the skin gets a rash, to treat the rash. Um, those types of things that provide comfort and um, you know just really directly um, help with the symptoms of, not cure the disease, but help with the symptoms, that's hospice care. And, and I've had my experience with hospice has been wonderful. If you do have someone that's dying and they're going into hospice, 
you want to check out the hospice agency because sometimes their philosophy is not keeping with Catholic faith. But um, most times, in my experience, it has been um, just a beautiful experience. So just to, just to reiterate, each of us decides the benefits and burdens of a specific treatment according to our own physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health at the time of the decision. A particular treatment for one person may be a benefit, while the, uh, the same treatment uh, may be a, a burden for someone else. Um, you know, everybody has to make their own decisions when it comes to this. And certainly you, um, as a caregiver, can be involved in that and, and being informed uh, about Catholic teaching on this is, is really important, especially for someone that's dying that's uh, a Catholic and wants to be following church teaching. And I always, I always like to leave people with this reference, this resource. The National Catholic Bioethics Center in Philadelphia offers free consultation um, on all types of bioethical issues, but specifically they do, do give some beautiful guidance on end-of-life care. So if you're ever in a position where a loved one is trying to discern a treatment option and whether or not it's extraordinary or ordinary and, and there's just a lot of confusion about it, you can email them or you can call them. And um, if you do call them, they do get back to you within 24 hours. And I've, been, I've gotten wonderful feedback on, on their guidance that they give. And um, so take this number down and this website down. It's a beautiful resource and it's free. And, and uh, they just do wonderful work for people that are needing guidance at this time. So number four, be steadfast in compassion. Com compassion means to suffer with, and your loved one will most likely have ups and downs in, in the final months, weeks, and days, and you need to surround them with love and support and companionship. It's really imp an important time not to be alone. And if they are alone, that's when they have that temptation to, um, you know, maybe take advantage of this new law that's, that's been introduced into our state uh, where you can hasten your own death by taking a legal um, amount of pills. Number five, help them to achieve closure. You know, some of us, a lot of us have a lot of unfinished business and we get a diagnosis and all of a sudden, you know, we need things to be taken care of. We need to, you know, we have financial concerns that we need to reconcile. We have unresolved relationships. You know, we might be not talking to someone and, and that's a terrible thing to, to leave up in the air. Um, things occupy our minds and, and you want to help your, love, your loved one to, um, you know, take care of some of those things. Um, that'll give them a sense of purpose and also help give them a sense of peace. So provide, number six, provide opportunities for resolution. Um, there's a book called F Four Most Important Things by Ira Bayak, and it, it's illustrating how you can say, I love you, I'm sorry, thank you, and I forgive you. Those are the four, four phrases that um, really uh, provide a lot of healing in the dying process. So invite others to visit. Um, this might help facilitate those opportunities of resolution. Um, you know, if there's someone that, you know, there's a falling out or whatever, you may want to try to invite them in. Um, again, listen to the, your loved one's uh, wishes, but um, provide those opportunities. You might want to invite the parish priest in to hear confession or to do the anointing of the sick. Another op opportunity to, um, to uh, you know, resolve things. I know my aunt was always angry with the Catholic Church, um, but in her final days, she agreed to have a priest come in. And by the time I got the priest in, she was no longer able to um, really do a confession. Um, but he did the anointing of the sick, and, I, and she actually mouthed the words of the, the, the prayers. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful moment um, in her final days. Number seven, uh, reminisce. Uh, think of the small comforts that you can provide that'll spark meaningful, uh, meaningful times, meaningful memories. It might be, you know, breaking out the photo album. It might be cooking something. And even, even if your loved one really can't eat, just the smell uh, can prov provide comfort to them. There might be some mementos that you can, um, you know, bring uh, to them that might help them spark some memories. If you have a pet, you know, uh, you know some people, my aunt loved my dog and just my dog loved her. And it was just beautiful. There's so many photos in her final weeks with the dog sitting next to her on the chair. And, my dog is not a lap dog, so they're very cute pictures, um, but he loved her, and she got such comfort out of petting him and, and spending time with him. Uh, also, my, my grandkids um, gave her a lot of pleasure, too, in those final days. Number eight, provide a peaceful presence. Um, there's a natural withdrawal, or even 
detachment in the final phases. Um, my mom, uh, when she realized she was going to be put on hospice, she immediately stopped talking. She detached herself. And that's a time when um, I think that the, the person that's dying is really trying to prepare themselves spiritually and emotionally um, for his or her own passing. It's a difficult time, and sometimes they just need to pull back. And so you just need to understand that that's natural and also to provide a presence anyway, even though they may not be talking or interacting too much. Sit with them, you know, uh, tell them stories. Uh, it's, it's just natural. Uh, talk to them, pray with them, um, but, but stay with them. Stay with them by the bedside and um, have that presence. Your presence is a present in these final days. Number nine, show tenderness. Human contact is so very important. I know when my mom was dying, she was never a physical person. She was never an affectionate person. So it was my turn to be able to like put lotion on her arms and her hands, brush her hair, assure her that um, you know she is really a gift from God, and um, just share mem sharing memories and just talking with her quietly, but being tender and showing that physical affection uh, was just so important. It was meaningful to me as well. And finally, um, bear the transition uh, patiently. Um, in the final days, there can be a very rapid physical change. Um, the breathing changes, the coloring of the skin changes. Um, there's a lot of physical changes that can happen rapidly, but um, you need to have the, you need to be patient with the process. You need to allow the how and when of death to be between God and your loved one. Um, ask God for the wisdom to know the final words to say, if any, and give your, give your loved one permission um, to pass. I know with my mom, um, you know, she was, she, she was scared, and uh, I would just pray with her, sit with her at, uh, at her bedside, and just tell her she was doing well, and that she was going to see my, my brother had passed about 16 years ago, and that she was going to see him soon, and she was going to love that, and I think that helped her. Um, I, I think I gave her permission to go. Same with my aunt. Her husband had just died maybe eight months before, and I told her she was going to be with Steve soon, and, and, um, and I think she was looking forward to seeing him. So that's a really important one, too. So I just want to finish. Uh, just, you know, Samaritan's Bonus is just a beautiful document. If you can get your hands on it and reading, read it. It offers so much hope because it points to Christ on the cross. Here's a quote. Christ is aware of the painful shock of his mother and his disciples who remain at the foot of the cross and who, though remaining, appear impotent and resigned and yet provide the effective intimacy that God, that allows God made man to live through hours that seem meaningless. So being present and suffering with are just such beautiful ways that we can honor our loved ones in their final days. I just want to read uh, another passage that just just really strikes me about this this whole this whole subject um, it's from a book called hope for a world without hope by donald demarco and it's about a nurse a, a nurse her name is um dusty and she's um a, a nurse that worked close to the front lines in vietnam and and she's she's tending she's actually tending um she's in the evacuation hospital as a surgical intensive care or emergency room nurse. And she's very close to all of the soldiers that come in from the field. And this is someone that she's, she's treating in, in the field. And she writes to him, she says, Hello, David, my name is Dusty. I'm your night nurse. I will stay with you. I will check your vitals every 15 minutes. I will document inevitability I will hang more blood and give you something for the pain. I will stay with you and I will touch your face. Yes, of course, I will write your mother and tell her you were brave. I will write your mother and tell her how much you loved her. I will write your mother and tell her to give your bratty kid sister a big kiss and a hug. What I will not tell her is that you were wasted. I will stay with you and I will hold your hand. I will stay with you and watch your life flow through my fingers into my soul. I will stay with you until you stay with me. 
Goodbye, David. My name is Dusty. I'm the last person you will see. I'm the last person you will touch. I'm the last person who will love you. Well, I just thought that was a beautiful, beautiful uh, little excerpt from this book. And as we um, continue to kind of work through this pandemic, um, and it brings new challenges to our society with each passing day, perhaps it's really a good time for us to reflect on the principles of love, compassion, and care that are outlined in Samaritanus Bonus, The Good Samaritan. Because we really never know when we'll be called to sit at the foot of the cross for someone we love. And that's really what it's all about. Journeying with them, sitting at the foot of the cross, and just being present. I hope this has been meaningful, meaningful for you. Um, I enjoyed sharing my, my experiences with you, and I recommend the resources that I've brought up during my talk. God bless you, and I'll be praying for you. Amen.